Hi, I'm the Serial Plagiarist. I wanted to talk about sequel fans again, but don't worry, I'm going to be giving them a tough time and making a video they'll never be able to respond to. Now, a lot of what I say in this video, I've said before many times, but it will be in greater detail. Here are 10 challenges for sequel fans, and if you manage to credibly answer all 10, I will give you a medal just for trying to address all 10. The thing with sequel fans is that they are very selective on what they talk about. Look at Goldman. Even though he makes hour-long analyses, he cherry-picked topics like Ray's and Mary Sue, which is admittingly an overbloated criticism of the sequel trilogy and a minor flaw compared to the bigger, more consequential problems of the sequel trilogy. And I'm willing to just give them that at this point because the Mary Sue criticism is just one problem with a specific character. And even if it's the main character, there's so many other problems with Rey that don't relate to her being so good at everything and being liked and admired by everyone. There's bigger fish people like me should fry. Especially now since Episode 7 is not the only sequel movie that's out now. So without further ado, here are 10 challenges for sequel fans. Again, none of the sequel trilogy fans will be able to address all 10 without making weak points or skirting around the issue but I'd love to be proven wrong. First, let's start off with what is possibly the easiest challenge. Of course, easiest does not mean easy by nature. Given this is a behind the scenes thing, it doesn't automatically apply to the films themselves, but I usually use this as the first line of defense to ask sequel fans confronting questions. So, if you didn't know, George Lucas was lied to before, during, and after the acquisition of Lucasfilm by Disney. In a separate topic, George Lucas was burnt out by all the online prequel hate. George's first choice to sell Star Wars was to the Walt Disney Corporation. George Lucas saw Bob Iger, the Disney CEO, as a friend. Before he sold the rights to Disney, he and Bob Iger had an agreement that they would use a sequel trilogy treatments for, well, the sequel trilogy. This wasn't in the contract, but it isn't the kind of thing that would be. George Lucas placed a significant amount of trust in Bob Iger that he would definitely use a sequel treatment. As we all know, the sequel trilogy, beyond a few vague ideas at best, discarded his treatments very early on in the sequel trilogy's production. And George Lucas felt betrayed. The source for this is Bob Iger himself in his autobiography, The Ride of a Lifetime, in the chapter in which he discusses the acquisition of Lucasfilm. This one chapter sparked mass outrage from those already disgruntled with Disney's treatment of Star Wars. The CEO of Disney, in his own words, said, and I quote, George Lucas felt betrayed. This one quote single-handedly proves the shameless mentality of a corporate executive, but beyond that, this fact pretty much kills anyone's respect for Disney and the sequel trilogy and those who made it. We know this definitely happened because this is a description from the CEO of Disney, aka the one who was at fault. This fact is also backed up by George in the Charlie Rose interview, although he doesn't explicitly say Bob Iger lied to him. So what is described here is an irrefutable fact. Commonly when I see a video defending the sequel trilogy, I ask one simple question. Why would you support the sequels after the revelation that George Lucas was lied to? Most of the time, I don't receive a proper response, but the few times I do, one response I got was outright denial of the evidence and that I was supporting fake news spread around by Mike Zero, or those who respond show their true colors by expressing hatred towards George Lucas. I think it's clear at this point that sequel fans don't care about honesty or don't care about the franchise, but here's your chance to prove me wrong. Your first challenge is to properly respond to the question I gave previously. Why would you support the sequels after the revelation that George Lucas was lied to. Again, looking at the context of what happened, most if not everyone would agree that promising something and then refusing to do so is wrong. Especially if the person who sold you the rights sold it to you for a steal price. George Lucas might have well have donated Star Wars to Disney. If you can answer why you support the sequels, despite the fact that the original visionary mind was backstabbed by the company 
that made the sequels without denying facts or expressing hatred towards the man, then you're all set for the next challenge. People who go for expressing hatred towards Lucas cite incorrect narratives like saved in the edit and other anti-Lucas straw man arguments. Some like to say that George Lucas doesn't have a say anymore because he sold the rights and therefore has no input nor the right to decide where Star Wars goes, which leads me to my next point. George Lucas is the visionary mind behind Star Wars and he knows better than anyone else about his own creation because he is the creator. He came up with it with his mind. George Lucas is Star Wars and anyone who says otherwise needs to be lured into a dark alleyway and bashed over the head until they comply to reality. Unfortunately, a lot of people think they know Star Wars better than the original creator and try to argue against the creator in his own work. The only valid time this is reasonable is when the creator changes his mind on the meaning of his creation, which George has actually done. Which is why I don't give anyone who criticizes General Grievous because Lucas was indecisive on what his personality and traits would be like any flack for it because it's reasonable. George Lucas shouldn't have been indecisive on who Grievous was. When George Lucas introduced Metachlorians, George Lucas did not contradict anything. It was just fanboys of the original movies who didn't realize it was made by George as well thought their preconceived perception of what the Force was was the definitive correct one. They made the false assumption that Metachlorians were the Force when they're actually a means of measuring Force sensitivity. Another example, people that like to argue that Yoda's depiction in the prequels was character assassination, but unlike Grievous, there are nuances people don't consider. First, the prequels are just that. Prequels. Stories that predate the original movies, with a younger Master Yoda in a vastly different position than the original trilogy. In the original trilogy, Yoda was a hermit in hiding and learning from the mistakes of the Jedi Order. In the prequels, Yoda is the Grand Master who is in the middle of making the mistakes. Just like any prequel should, it's showing us how we got to Yoda on Dagobah. The same is true for the lightsaber complaint. It's explicitly shown in Revenge of the Sith that Yoda lost his lightsaber. Thus why he didn't have one in Empire Strikes Back. So point is, what makes prequel hate different from sequel hate is that prequel hate was people thinking they knew better than the original creator, while sequel hate is people calling out how J.J. Abrams nor Ryan Johnson understand anything about George Lucas's saga. So here's your challenge. Try to argue why George Lucas's opinion doesn't matter, even in the modern day, even though it clearly does. Again, those who argue he doesn't matter anymore are the same people who say George Lucas is a creative hack and a greedy businessman, an awful person, blah blah blah. To reinforce the first two points on top of that, one reason why the sequels suck is because neither JJ or Ryan understand anything about Star Wars and the meaning of it. The sequels are not authentic as true Star Wars movies, but that doesn't automatically mean they are unfaithful adaptations. That's an important distinction I want to make. When it comes to both JJ and Ryan, they have contradicted what George Lucas has explained about his work. As an example, Balance in the Force. Balance in the Force according to George Lucas, aka the guy who's irrefutably correct, means the dominance of the light side over the dark. When the Empire reigned, the Force was imbalanced and the galaxy was corrupted. When Anakin was redeemed and got rid of Sidious, balance was restored. This is because the will of the Force knows better than any one individual. Ryan Johnson in The Last Jedi didn't know that and had the incorrect belief that balance in the force meant equal light side and equal dark side, not understanding that the force had a will that was strictly defined as the light side. He's realized that if he brings the Jedi back into this, then the Sith are gonna rise up again, and the whole thing is gonna start again, and it's just gonna be more, more misery. So one foundation for Luke's character is that he realizes that balance in the force meant equal Jedi and equal Sith. It's balance to the force, not force users, Ryan. This proves that Ryan Johnson doesn't understand the Force, nor does he understand Luke Skywalker. This is the single argument I use to get sequel fans to shut up about how Luke was well written. If Luke believed this, then he would be a delusional, crazy old man, 
which he was in The Last Jedi. That's what we've been criticizing all this time. That's why we've been naming him Jake Skywalker. A core pillar for Luke's character in The Last Jedi is the incorrect meaning of balance in the Force. What essentially happened is that Ryan Johnson was trying to decide what Star Wars meant, but it wasn't his place to decide at all. The only person who dictates what Star Wars is or isn't is George Lucas, and only George Lucas. Ryan should have stuck to what George Lucas meant with Star Wars, or he should have just fucked off. Don't think this is solely going to be a bashing of Ryan Johnson, because contrary to the popular narrative, JJ doesn't understand Star Wars either. There are many examples I could use, but one is for sensitivity. JJ, in many statements before and during the sequel trilogy's release cycle, talked about his preconceived notion of what it meant to have the Force and how he thought the Force is in everyone and that anyone could use it, resulting in a mishmash of the overall story because the prequel said one thing and the sequel said another. It's what led to characters like Rey because she just believed in the Force. She wasn't explicitly someone who had a high metachlorine count or anything like that. She just had the power because everyone has it. The only thing he got right was that the Force was in everyone. But the reason, say, Greedo couldn't use the Force was because he didn't have a strong enough connection to it. I equate J.J. Abrams and Ryan Johnson in terms of their writing philosophy as Darksiders. George Lucas, as the creator of the story, is essentially the will of Star Wars. He knows better than any other being. But J.J. and Ryan didn't care about adhering to the will of George Lucas, and instead imposed their own will on Star Wars. Which is why the sequels retcon, contradict, and fuck up practically everything about the story that wasn't theirs. Just like the dark side, it was inherently selfish and corrupted the franchise around them. This is why I found it impossible to respect JJ and Ryan as people. Because they couldn't respect something they were essentially stealing, not borrowing, since Disney didn't give Star Wars back to George after they were done. So here's your challenge sequel fans, explain why the sequels are good despite the fact that they make an absolute roadkill on continuity and destroy the foundation and meaning of Star Wars. The Star Wars sequels is just that, sequels. A sequel is a work that continues a previous one, and the sequels are bad because they are bad sequels to the original six movies because the people who made them know absolutely nothing about Star Wars and impose their own will on the story. Those arguing George Lucas has no say anymore are no better than JJ and Ryan. They are selfishly imposing their own will on Star Wars and ignoring the will of George Lucas. If you've made it this far, let's continue. The sequels contribute nothing to the overall story. This doesn't make them bad movies automatically, but it shows the cash grab nature of the sequel trilogy. They just made extensions of a story that was concluded without realizing that they needed to do some legwork and give a reason to continue the story. We all know that there was no plan for the sequel trilogy at all, but they don't contribute to the thematic purpose of the original six movies. George Lucas, the person who no one can argue with when it comes to Star Wars, has said that the complete saga was Anakin's story, from childhood to death. We see the entire life story of Anakin, his freedom from slavery, his inner conflict, his struggles, his fall, his bitterness, and then his redemption. It is a complete story. Admittingly, even though I am confident my version of the sequel trilogy didn't break any of the rules, it didn't adhere to the thematic purpose of the saga. That being to make it Anakin's story. Which now that I understand this, I will involve Anakin more in my idea of the sequel trilogy. But if I wanted to continue the story the way I wanted, I'd just drop the numbers. And that's the big dilemma with the sequel trilogy. The fact that they weren't thematically sound with the complete saga, but also that they were numbered. Numbering the sequels 7, 8, and 9 is a disgrace. They should have had Anakin in them if that was the case. You might be asking how they were supposed to continue Anakin's story if he's dead, and half of you might expect an answer like, don't make the sequels at all, or don't number them, but my answer is actually a lot different. As we all know, Anakin became a force ghost, so what they should have done if they wanted to continue the saga is continue Anakin's story. Perhaps by having him reflect on his entire life and then finally letting go of his consciousness and letting him become one with the force. 
That's established to be a thing. In Hair to the Empire, Yoda and Obi-Wan let go of their consciousness and allowed themselves to become one with the Force as a whole. This would have been an actually clever way of continuing the story of the Chosen One and allowed them to number them at the same time. That way, it would be after his death, but not be a lazy attempt at resurrecting the character. But because JJ as a prequel hater loathed the legend we know as Hayden Christensen, the closest we had to an appearance by the Chosen One was him chanting to Rey among all the other Jedi, something that breaks yet more rules. Most of the Jedi speaking to Rey did not retain their consciousness after death. They clearly just did that for fan service without recognizing consistency. The only way they can fix that is by creating another problem by resurrecting Mace Windu and having him learn to retain his consciousness until his actual death. Then it explains how he spoke to Rey. But of course it would ruin his death in Episode 3, and given Episode 3 is the best, I will not accept that just to fill in a plot hole. So challenge number 4. Explain why the sequels truly contribute to the Skywalker saga. Given the protagonist of the sequels wasn't even a Skywalker, and no, a surname switch isn't going to cut it, this question will probably be impossible to answer if not definitely. Explain how the thematic purpose was maintained, and then we'll talk. The reason why the sequels have so many plot holes is because the sequels didn't establish why anything was happening. It didn't explore the universe and the scale was smaller than what was practical for the sequels to actually make sense. Sequel fans actively cherry pick the criticisms we talk about, instead of trying to address all the problems. I've never seen a sequel fan anywhere in the universe try to defend against every criticism. They mostly only talk about the criticisms people made about the sequels at first, like the sequels being rip-offs, Rey is a Mary Sue, Luke Skywalker and the Last Jedi was out of character and sucked, bringing Palpatine back, etc. But through observation, now that the whole trilogy is out and we see the whole picture, we have come up with deeper reasons why the sequels actually suck, as well as nuances for all those specific criticisms. Like with the rip-off complaint, the reason it matters, compared to a rehashy sequel like Ghostbusters 2, is because the sequels invalidated the original six movies by undoing the Rebel Triumph in Return of the Jedi and resetting the status quo to Empire vs. Rebels. Ghostbusters 2, while it retreads the same structure as the original, have the Ghostbusters face a threat independent to that of the first movie. In the first movie, it was Goza. In the second movie, it was Vigo. Ghostbusters the video game and Ghostbusters Afterlife, while they do have the Ghostbusters face the same threat as the first movie, do not reset the conflict, only continue it. This is what the Thrawn trilogy does so well. It doesn't reset the conflict, they continue it. But back to the lack of world building. The reasons people complain about plot holes can be chalked up to the films giving zero context for the wider galaxy. For example, the reason why Starkiller Base makes no sense is because where did the significantly smaller First Order get the resources and money to make a bigger, better Death Star? This plot hole is somewhat patched in the novel Bloodline, where it's explained that there was a rift in the New Republic Senate, and different parties secretly started giving money and resources to the First Order. So the New Republic was essentially paying the First Order for its eventual demise. That actually makes sense. And this should have been explained in The Force Awakens because it explains what is essentially a copy-paste, nonsensical Death Star 3. Although it still doesn't make sense on how the Starkiller base laser can hyperspace all the way to the New Republic and how systems far away from the New Republic could see it. The Visual Dictionary tries to patch this up too, but Pablo Hidalgo should have just faced it. There was no way to explain it without using mental gymnastics or making a complete ass hat out of yourself. Why Leia is with the Resistance and not the New Republic Army, or what the Resistance actually is, how the First Order rose from the ashes of the Empire, who Snoke is, and why the war is actually happening, would have all been non-issues if the writers did world building. The reason they didn't is because of J.J. Abrams, but we'll talk about that in the next point. For now, your new challenge is to explain the plot holes without relying on external source material and explaining how the sequel trilogy does enough world building. I've never had 
anyone talk back to me after I brought this up. So this challenge is unfortunately going to keep you occupied for a long time. But that's fine. Take all the time you need. Sequel fans use the reception of The Force Awakens, at least at first, to try and say that the hate is unfounded, at least specifically for that movie. Well, let me explain why so many changed their mind, especially after The Last Jedi came out. J.J. Abrams is a pioneer, and basically the mascot, of a writing technique he calls the Mystery Box. To explain what this is, he infamously used this trick in the TV show Lost. Basically what he did is set up questions that hooked the audience in and kept people guessing and encouraged them to continue watching until the very finale of the show. Basically what he was doing is coming up with questions and heavily relied on the audience's imagination instead of his own to sell the story. From what I hear, when Lost finally did end, the answers were so lame and disappointing and the fact there was going to be absolutely no way there was going to be a satisfying payoff for it all, especially for how long the show actually went on for. I think what JJ was trying to do works best when it's in a concise standalone story. Like with the Maze Runner movie, that film keeps the mystery of why all the boys are in the maze and it doesn't just cut off the story until the next movie is made. That's the example of the mystery box done better. JJ's flaw in writing almost perfectly describes the sequels. Who are Rey's parents? Who is Snoke? What is Luke's conflict? Why did Kylo Ren fall to the dark side? Who are the Knights of Ren? All of those did the exact same thing Lost did all those years ago. It made people go crazy with questions and speculate to the end of the earth the answers. JJ again was relying on the audience's imagination instead of his own, which is backwards from a storytelling perspective. We go to watch, read, or play fiction to see an author tell his complete story and not let the audience come up with their own story and fill in the blanks. The reason why the sequel sucked so much was because the payoff was so hollow and underwhelming. Who are Ray's parents? Nobody's and then Palpatine. We'll get into the consistencies later. Who is Snoke? A clone created by the true villain, Palpatine. Again, we'll get to that later. What is Luke's conflict? Pretty much nothing. He just went onto the island to die and thinks the Jedi should end. Why did Kylo Ren fall to the dark side? Because Palpatine was fucking with his mind. Who are the Knights of Ren? Fuck if I know. They are just bad guys that are meant to be killed off. Hopefully you get the point. But on top of that, even the titles for the films are mystery boxes. The Force Awakens. That isn't meant to be taken literally, but what does that mean? There's something about the Force Awakening and Rey and Finn or something, but that doesn't answer the question directly. Plus, it isn't a key part of what actually happens in the movie. Unlike Attack of the Clones or Revenge of the Sith, The Last Jedi, the movie doesn't make it clear on what it means. They mention the term The Last Jedi maybe like two times to my recollection, but it's just so vague and was part of Ryan Johnson's themes and he wanted you to think about the deeper meaning of the story. And as I said previously, the deeper meaning of The Last Jedi violates Star Wars by George Lucas. Then there's The Rise of Skywalker. Not only does the opposite happen in the movie, because both Leia and Ben Solo die, officially ending the bloodline, but even Kathleen Kennedy confirms that it's just meant to invoke speculation. I think The Rise of Skywalker it doesn't answer anything. It actually, it's provocative, it asks questions, and it could mean a lot of different things. And I think that that's what was important to us. We didn't want to have a title that felt like it was telling you the story. So here's your challenge. Explain how the mystery box assists the movie instead of hindering it, and how J.J. Abrams' reliance on audiences' imaginations is a good thing for a story and not a lazy way of selling the next movie. Get tickets now. The sequels can't even be watched 20 years into the future. The way they were supposed to be watched was at the moment right when they came out from 2015 to 19. That's not how you make a movie remembered or timeless. Speaking of... I hear a lot of sequel fans talk about how kids 20 years into the future are going to look back on the sequels as their first and favourites. And this is very unlikely and absurd. Prequel resurgence happened not because of relative comparison to the sequels, but also because what people came to realize about the prequels are solid foundations that the sequels do not have. 
For example, the prequels have a cohesive, connected story to each other, but on top of that, the original trilogy too. Each entry of the original saga is part of a whole story. The Phantom Menace is not a movie fans can skip. What happens in it has direct consequences to the sequel and the sequel after that and so on. The prequels are reactive to what happens in each other's separate entries. Anakin evolves from fear, anger, hate, and then suffering. Told throughout the course of three movies and then continued in the original trilogy. It all fits. It's like poetry. They rhyme. As I said before, the sequels don't contribute anything to the overall saga, but on top of that, they actively contradict each other. The Force Awakens does not connect to The Last Jedi or The Rise of Skywalker, nor does The Last Jedi connect to The Force Awakens or The Rise of Skywalker. You could put it in any combination, and they are like three different IPs with how much they contradict each other. The most blatant example is Rey being a nobody, and then a Palpatine in the movie after that. They couldn't make up their damn minds. And according to Nerd Dominus, who has made a video discussing whose fault it is for the sequel trilogy as a whole, whether it's Ryan's, JJ's, or some other person's, he makes it clear that in The Force Awakens, that her parents were intended to be Han and Leia. That means that all three movies have three different answers to who Rey's parents are. So pretty much you have to stick with one, and not two or three, otherwise you'd be a fan of two or three different movies that are supposed to be in the same universe, but none of them work with each other, at all. So pick one, is she a Solo, Nobody, or Palpatine? People have pointed out how many retcons and backtracking J.J. Abrams made because he's a spineless coward and can't carry on with the story Ryan told in The Last Jedi. It's impractical to like all three movies because none of them work with each other. You have different rules or rule breaks as I established way back when. That's why there are divides, even in the sequel fanbase, which oh boy, we'll get to that. But first, the challenge for sequel fans. You need to explain how the sequels are a cohesive story with each other and tell the same story instead of mishmashing and changing the story as a reaction to backlash. And do it without blaming Last Jedi haters. Because J.J. Abrams was just a spineless coward who has the weakest willpower in Hollywood and changed everything out of fear of further backlash. Anyways, next point. The sequel trilogy has divided the fan base for the worse, especially The Last Jedi. People are at each other's necks, and I can explain why. Both JJ and Ryan are pretentious filmmakers with enormous egos who cannot look past their lack of talent and see their dumb good luck and adherence to Hollywood shit standards as self-worth. Ryan Johnson specifically has talked about how he's the type of guy who likes to talk about how much he likes dividing people. Um, I would be worried if everybody across the board was like, yeah, that was a good movie. It's much more exciting to me when you get, you know, um, a group of people who are like coming up to you and, and really, really excited about it and you know it's going to be something that they're having their DVD collection and watch you over. And the way that I got into like, you know, Miller's Crossing maybe, I don't know. But, uh, it, and then there are other people who walk out just, I mean, literally saying that was the worst movie I've ever seen. Having those two extremes to me is, you know, is the mark of uh, the type of movie that I want to make, so. Even if it's out of context, it's a sixth sense of foreshadowing on what The Last Jedi ended up being. Luke Skywalker's depiction is terrible as I've already established, but it was quite clearly done that way. The reason he didn't ease us into Luke Skywalker's sudden change in personality is because it was like a social experiment where he wanted to divide half and half of the fan base who would take one of two different messages out of the movie. Luke Skywalker could have had most of the self-conflicts done in a different way without, reduce, without reducing him to a pathetic, dirty, homeless man. But he went for the most blunt approach possible, and this was clearly done to divide fans. Look at how unapologetic he's been to people who didn't like the movie, calling them man babies. Not only is that unprofessional, but it's given me an even greater respect for George Lucas. Because no matter how much Red Letter Media and all those other idiots talk trash about him, he never, ever lashed out at them. Even though if he did, it would have been completely reasonable given how far they went and how much they crossed the line. Ryan Johnson is obviously someone who aims to provoke one half 
and amaze the other half with pretentious themes and messages that break continuity. This is as blatant as a case as I'm making it. Ryan Johnson did not make a Star Wars movie for everyone, so please stop saying that. He did not set out to make the best movie possible, but unfortunately people had high standards and therefore he wouldn't be able to please everyone, because that narrative is wrong. I'm not saying some people didn't have unrealistically high, lucid dream-like standards, but most people's high standards are justified given the foundation of the original six movies. This isn't like Terminator which had a drop after the third movie, because Star Wars was a six-way streak of quality, which is an impressive record for a film series that was broken with The Force Awakens. This is why I have high standards, because George Lucas made it that way, and the inheritors better step up to the level of George Lucas. Go big or go home. So how does this relate to the next challenge? Well here's what I want you to do. Explain how the sequels weren't made to divide fans, because on top of everything I've said prior to this point, it's a stance I'm very confident in taking. Have you ever noticed how closed off Disney is compared to the George Lucas era? What I mean by this is whenever they talk, it's only about the exciting stuff. But we know for a fact that to the people working on the sequels, it was anything but. J.W. Rinsler, bless your soul, was the writer of the behind the scenes books of the original six movies, where he would give the full picture into the development of all six movies. Well, Rinsler was going to write a book doing the same for The Force Awakens, but the thing is, Disney as a corporation having a narcissistic squeaky clean image canned Rinsler's book after he planned to go into the whole story of the behind the scenes production of The Force Awakens as he gave an accurate account of what happened, and it didn't paint the whole thing as sunshine and rainbows. In other words, it was development hell. So basically, Rinsler's book was cancelled and now we rely on secondhand drip feeding of information that seems to come out every fortnight at this point. But that further highlights the disaster that was the sequel trilogy's production. So what Disney essentially did is paint the production of all three movies as Disney World in their featurettes. They don't go into the hurdles of the production and how they overcame it. No, they just go on and on about how much fun it was to work on the movie and go on and on and on and on and on and on and on about that. And it's boring, hollow, and dishonest. No film has a flawless production. I would actually like to see the production of all three films to see how they overcame problems during filming. Like maybe how the set was too hot or too cold, or how hard it was making a particular set, or maybe how some of the scenes were hard to shoot. Stuff like that. You guys know that urban legend known as Mauschwitz that has Disney World employees describe their job as the unhappiest place in the world? opposite to that of the tourists, which is a play on words on, well, you know. That's exactly like the development of the sequels. They're presented to outsiders as a happy place to work, but it's actually darker than that. Way darker. Okay, maybe not that dark. On top of this, you look at a bunch of interviews given over the course of the sequel trilogy's release cycle, before, during, and after, and you'll see how much everyone contradicts each other. J.J. Abrams says one thing, then Kathleen Kennedy says something else, Bob Iger swoops in to say that, George Lucas goes on about this and that, and it just confuses you. Who's telling the truth? This is what makes it even harder to determine what happened exactly. Although we can make it easier by taking context into account, and when things were said, and the general track record of honesty from each person. This makes the sequel trilogy very mysterious, and not just because of the mystery boxes. But that's not directly relevant. What I'm challenging you to now is to explain why you trust Disney unfathomably, given their track record. A lot of what sequel fans believe is based on what a certain person who worked on the sequel said, when it may contradict another statement. This is mostly an external reason, but it's very important for you to answer, because Disney is a corporation, not an independent entity like George Lucas. Anyone who knows the first thing about a monopoly like Disney is that they don't give a shit about quality. Just money. One last challenge before we're done. Stop cherry picking. If you're going to debate with sequel haters like me, address everything they say about the sequels and understand why they hate it. 
The Mary Sue complaint is only a minor flaw with the sequels, and not even close to a full view of the bigger picture, such as everything I've pointed out to you. All the examples I listed previously is a good place to start, because I find it hard to believe you managed to make it this far. You're probably still on number one, and I'm not trying to be mean. Also, if you decide to stop cherry picking, here's an additional challenge. Explain why you cherry picked in the first place, because to me, it seems like you can't actually explain anything on why the sequels are good and don't deserve the hate. An infuriating example of how you cherry pick is the expanded universe. In debates where you protest against the sequels being decanonized, the only thing you have to say about the expanded universe was that it was never canon, which misses the mark completely. But your basis from that is quotes from George Lucas. They are all out of context, cherry picked, misunderstood, or not representative of the full picture. But you don't even realize that if George Lucas defines canonicity, then the sequels aren't canon either. So here's an extra, extra challenge. Don't spread lies about the expanded universe. Instead, stick to the facts and explain why it's selfish to decanonize the sequels and not when Disney got rid of 30 plus years of content to make way for the sequels in the first place. If the expanded universe was never decanonized, the sequels would never exist. Remember that. Also, an extra, extra, extra challenge I have for you is to actually indulge on the expanded universe. Read some of the acclaimed books. The Thrawn trilogy is a good place to start, given that's commonly referred to as the original sequel trilogy. The Order is Heir to the Empire, Dark Force Rising, and The Last Command. If you read them, you'll immediately notice the contrast in quality compared to the sequel trilogy. If your reasoning for not doing so is that you don't enjoy reading, then listen to the audiobook while you exercise or lie in bed. To the first sequel fan that contacts me on Discord, start that free one month trial of Audible and I'll buy Hair to the Empire for you. I'll pay for the first book, guilt free, and you'll realize that the sequels are soulless cash grabs, like we've been saying all this time. Just make sure to get the 20th anniversary edition and not the monotone original version, because the 20th anniversary edition is the closest to being like a new Star Wars movie. I'm the type of guy who tries to share the expanded universe with others, which is why I've gotten other people's Steam keys for Knights of the Old Republic, because I want them to experience the legend of that game. Also disclaimer, there is no expiry date or any tricks I'm pulling up my sleeve. Just contact me and I'll send the money to your PayPal, which you'll then use to buy the audiobook. And also show me that you got the audiobook and didn't spend that money on something else through a screenshot. So that's 10 or technically 13 challenges for sequel fans. I have no doubt that sequel fans are going to struggle with number one, let alone the next 12. And that's by design. I'm not going to make this easy for you. You can persist with your narrative that the sequels are going to be loved in 10 years or whatever, or you can join reality and join the backlash against the corporation that doesn't give a shit about you. The choice is yours. Blue pill or red pill. I'm JJ Plagiarisms, and until next time, what are stories but mystery boxes? Washed with